How do Democrats plan to get this done and what dirty tricks are they on the alert for? Joining us now is Minnesota Democratic Senator, a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Let's talk about how this process is going to go. We, th so I, I am usually, I mean, we know how these things go by the book, but we also know how perverted the process has been in recent years by the stuff that Mitch McConnell has been willing to do, um, in, in both with open seats and to fill seats. Are you worried about there being shenanigans or dirty tricks that you haven't previously had to deal with in terms of filling this seat? Well, we're used to it. I mean, they throw everything at these nominees and we must be ready to defend them and make the case for them because they themselves can't go on TV. I remember uh, playing this role when Elena Kagan was nominated, when Sonia Sotomayor and making getting the true facts out there about their record and their story. But what we have here is very different situation. Uh, it is a 50 50 Senate. Uh, but Dick Durbin controls the gavel. And I will say under his leadership and Senator Schumer's leadership on the floor, as been noted, uh, we have confirmed more judges last year than any uh, president has put forth uh, since Ronald Reagan, since you started your show that way. So we have a lot of experience getting this done. We have a White House that has vetted a number of nominees, well aware that this could be coming down the pike. We have so much respect for Justice Breyer and his incredible record, uh, but they knew there was a chance he would step down. Um, so I feel like we're in about as good a situation as we can be. And so after uh, the nomination is made, you know, you look at the numbers. Uh, Sotomayor was 66 days. Kagan was 87 days. Gorsuch was 65 days. Uh, Kavanaugh was 88 days. And of course, Barrett, as you noted, 27 days. But who's counting? Um, I think everyone <laughs> will be. Um, and so a lot of this will be we then meet with the nominees. They try to meet with everyone on the committee as well as other senators. And we have a judicial questionnaire that some of them filled out in the last few years. So that's helpful. They have a head start. Um, and then uh, Senator Durbin schedules the hearing. It's usually, as you know, a day of openings and then from the senators and the opening statement of the nominee and then a day or two days of questions um, and then usually a panel of experts at the end. Because we're 50-50, you don't have that immediate vote out of committee unless we do pick up a Republican vote. And Republicans have, in the last few decades, voted for nominees from Democratic presidents. Um, and so recall that. If that happens, then we get out. If it doesn't, if it's split, uh, then we will have uh, use something called Rule 14, uh, which will allow uh, Senator Durbin to give this to Senator Schumer, basically, and it goes to the floor for a vote. But yeah, when you're 50-50, it makes for more shenanigans. <laughs> and Senator, in, in terms of the timing from the White House, how important is it, um, the timing in terms of when you first get the name of the nominee? Obviously, the process has to take as long as the process is going to take once it's formally before the Judiciary Committee and then the Senate. But how quickly should the White House act here? Well, they'll want to interview people because even though they know this might be coming, I would assume that uh, President Biden, with his vast experience as former chair of the Judiciary Committee, knows the importance of talking to the nominees. So I assume he will get it down to a few people and then give us a name. But of course, the sooner the better. And I think that was uh, what was so good about the timing of uh, Justice Breyer's announcement. He knows what's going on. He knows this isn't an easy situation. Anyone that watches C-SPAN realizes that. Um, and so not waiting till the very end or the beginning of the term Term, uh, makes this a lot more doable. Just as there had never been a woman on the Supreme Court before Ronald Reagan promised it and then made it happen, there has also to this day never been a black woman Supreme Court justice. Joe Biden promised in the campaign this past year that he would make that happen. Well, now today, upon the retirement of longtime Justice Stephen Breyer, that pledge from Joe Biden is operative. The White House is reminded of it today, says President Biden, plans to stick to that pledge. And yes, conservatives are going crazy about it, pretending there's absolutely no precedent for this. And this is an outrageous thing that Joe Biden promised to do, like Ronald Reagan didn't exist. Ronald who? 
It's also worth knowing, though, that when Joe Biden made this pledge during the campaign, this pledge that he is now going to live by and that's going to make that's going to that's going to shape history from here on out over these next few days and months until we get the new nominee on the court. I mean, when Joe Biden made this pledge, which we are now going to live by, it was a really consequential thing when he did it. It had a huge political impact when he did it. And it was also no sure thing that he was going to do it. At least by one account, his most influential staff members on the campaign told him as late as the day as he made the pledge that he shouldn't do it. Uh, This is is from a book about the Biden campaign by reporters Jonathan Allen uh, and Amy Parnes. Uh, The book is called Lucky, How Joe Biden Barely Won the Presidency. Uh, This is such a great anecdote from the book. Check this out. Quote, Jim Clyburn had heard enough, or really not enough. The House Democratic whip pushed himself out of his seat at Charleston's uh, Gayard Center Concert Hall. He dashed for the exit with the urgency that friends recognized as a 79-year-old man's hurry to find a restroom. But Clyburn, forgive me, didn't need to pee. He needed to find Joe Biden, and fast, before the end of a commercial break during that night's presidential debate. It was February 25th, four days before the South Carolina primary, and Biden was blowing it again. Almost an hour and 45 minutes had passed in the debate already, and Biden hadn't mentioned the one promise Jim Clyburn had said would nail down black votes in South Carolina throughout the rest of the primary and in the general election. Clyburn was shocked, but not stunned. He made a beeline for the backstage area. Pete Buttigieg approached to greet the most powerful Democrat in South Carolina politics. Clyburn brushed Mayor Pete aside. His eyes darted around, and he finally found Biden. They huddled together out of earshot of the other candidates. There wasn't much time until Biden had to be back on stage for the final segment of the debate. Quote, you've had a couple of opportunities to mention naming a black woman to the Supreme Court. Clyburn lectured his friend of nearly half a century like a school teacher scolding a child. I'm telling you, don't you leave the stage tonight without making it known that you will do that. Biden had seemed to get it the night before when Clyburn talked to him at a Congressional Black Caucus reception aboard the USS Yorktown, a decommissioned aircraft carrier that sat in Charleston Harbor as part of a naval museum. Biden was desperate to get Clyburn's endorsement. Very few endorsements carry weight in modern politics. In South Carolina, though, a perception had built up that Clyburn's imprimatur meant everything. Voters believed it. The media believed it. Even most political insiders thought there was at least a good helping of truth in it. There was no black political figure in the history of the state of South Carolina who had more influence with black voters, either in South Carolina or across the Deep South. James Clyburn wanted to endorse Biden. In fact, he had no intention of endorsing any other candidate, but he could also see how badly the wheels had come off Biden's campaign earlier. And he was a savvy enough politician to know that there wasn't much point in endorsing someone who was going to lose. On the USS Yorktown the night before the debate, Clyburn and a few of his CBC colleagues offered Biden counsel and made what amounted to a political ask. Quote, find a way to say that you were a part of picking the first Latina woman member of the United States Supreme Court, Sonia Sotomayor, and that you're looking forward to making the first African-American woman a member of the United States Supreme Court, Clyburn said. Clyburn believed, and there was good evidence to support his view, that a Supreme Court justice was worth a lot more to the black community than a vice president. VPs come and go, Clyburn thought. Al Gore was vice president. Where is he now? But a Supreme Court seat, well, that's for life. The meeting on the Yorktown was fresh and front of mind for Biden the next day as he prepared for that night's debate. He understood the difference between a narrow victory and a blowout his margins with black voters. If he committed to naming a black woman to the United States Supreme Court, that might give him a lift. I think I should do it, he told his advisors. Don't do it, Simone Sanders replied, speaking in concert with the group. If he wanted to do it at some point, his advisors agreed with one another, he should make a carefully considered plan around announcing that. It wasn't the kind of thing he should just throw out there on a debate stage. Besides, it might look like he was pandering. It might backfire. Biden was torn. But Clyburn and his Congressional Black Caucus colleagues believed their message had landed. And so the next night, as Clyburn watched the debate unfold and didn't hear the words come out of Biden's mouth, he grew more and more frustrated. One opening, two, then three. Why won't he say it? Clyburn asked himself. Finally, Clyburn took matters into his own hands at that commercial break. Backstage, Biden looked his friend in the eye and nodded his assurance. Clyburn returned to his seat to watch the end of the debate. And then, of course, 
This is what happened at the end of the debate. We talked about the Supreme Court. I'm looking forward to making sure there's a black woman on the Supreme Court to make sure we, in fact, get every representation. Not a joke. Not a joke. I pushed very hard for that. And my President. mother's motto was, she said, you know, you're defined by your courage, you're redeemed by your loyalty. I am loyal. I do what I say. I am loyal. I do what I say after being drowned out briefly there by applause in the room. I do what I say. What he said he would do is put an African-American woman on the United States Supreme Court if he were elected president and had a nomination to make. That was four days before the South Carolina primary. It was the first time he had ever made that pledge. You heard the crowd go wild. South Carolina Congressman Jim Clyburn endorsed President Biden the next day in an incredibly emotional, incredibly effective endorsement. Clyburn's endorsement is credited to this day by many people uh, with Joe Biden winning South Carolina, winning Super Tuesday, and ultimately thereby winning the Democratic nomination and the presidency of the United States. But Congressman Jim Clyburn himself told NBC News today that what he credits Biden's win in South Carolina to is not actually his own endorsement of Joe Biden. What he credits Biden's win in South Carolina to is that pledge that Biden made on the debate stage the night before his endorsement. That pledge Clyburn pushed him backstage to make that an African-American woman would finally be nominated to the nation's highest court for the first time in our country's history if Joe Biden were elected president. And now here we are today. January 2022, officially waiting to hear who President Biden's nominee is going to be, knowing he will keep that pledge, and having the opportunity now to ask his former advisors from the campaign if it really went down like that, and if they really, truly did tell him not to do it that night, to not take that leap, not there, not then. Joining us now, I am delighted to say, is Simone Sanders, former chief spokesperson for Vice President Harris, former senior advisor on President Biden's presidential campaign. Uh, Simone also just signed on to host a new show here on MSNBC, which has everybody at MSNBC over the moon. Um, Ms. Sanders, it is such a pleasure to have you here, and it's such a pleasure that you are joining MSNBC. I'm so glad, so grateful for you. Thank you, Rachel. I'm happy to be here. And I see, I mean, you put the T, as some people would call it, right out there at the top of the show. So I, I love the lead up today. It was great. <laughs> well, let me ask you um, if that if the, the account in that book is broadly correct. Did you and other advisors to President Biden think that that was a that was not the right move when he made that pledge at that debate sta- on that debate stage in South Carolina? Well, I will note a number of the things in that book are not true, but that is, in fact, true. There was lots of debate in the lead up to uh, that that debate in South Carolina in February about what then candidate Biden should do. There was never a question about if the commitment was real, similar to the commitment that the president, uh, then candidate Biden, made himself about making sure that his running mate would be a woman. That is a commitment that Joe Biden himself made, something that he felt very strongly about. And similarly is the commitment that he made in February on the debate stage. Uh, as, as the book is also true, that some folks, myself included, didn't want it to be seen as pandering to just throw it out there on a, on a debate stage and for folks to say that the then candidate Biden was just doing it to get votes of black voters when uh, many of us, people who know uh, the president very well, I count myself among those folks, know where he stands on those issues. I would like to note that Joe Biden, (laughs) as he usually does, went out there on that debate stage in February and uh, he went with his gut and his gut was right, Rachel. And today, (laughs) you folks all across America were excited. I I tweeted it was a great day to be a a black woman in America with the Juris Doctorate. And I think that's absolutely true. And this energy that folks are are feeling on the Democratic side of the aisle, I think voters uh, and Democrats and strategists would be good to remember that. And if I were at the White House right now, I would have asked to get into the meeting in the OPSO meeting, the Office of Political Strategy, and say, how are we thinking about uh, galvanizing people around this and keeping the energy up through the rest of this year into the midterm election? Joining us now uh, is our friend Dahlia Lithwick. She is senior editor and legal correspondent at Slate.com. Her article today about Stephen Breyer's retirement is titled The Deep Irony of Stephen Breyer's Bare-Knuckled Exit from the Supreme Court. I think about Stephen Breyer in a lot of different ways. I never, ever think about his knuckles, bare or otherwise. Dahlia, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. 
it, it's good to be here on a day, Rachel, when everybody's a little giddy. It's so rare, yeah. I feel, to have from the roses to the chuckling. It's nice to have good news. <laughs> Well, it's also like, you know, it's it's history. I get I get like this about State of the Union and stuff like this. There's just some things, at least from the news business part of it, like we're about to get a Supreme Court nominee. Like if you're lucky, that happens one time in your career when you have the, the, the honor and the responsibility of getting to cover the news. It's always a huge deal, whether you love the nominee or you don't. Um, but it's, it's this is a big deal. This is varsity level news. And that's it's thrilling. And it's also I have to say it's it's a pleasure to be able to cover this, knowing that Stephen Breyer, Justice Breyer, has chosen to leave on his own terms. We're not covering him because he because he passed away or we're not covering him because he was forced out in some difficult circumstances. It does seem like he left on his own on his own terms. He did. I will say I'm a little sad for him, Rachel. And I know we've talked about it a bunch, you know, and I've said on even on this show, you know, there's no point in asking Justice Breyer if ju judges are partisan and political, because it's like asking the Easter Bunny if there's such a thing as the Easter Bunny. You know, he believes <laughs> so deeply in this notion that the justices are not partisan, that the court is something bigger, something better than that. And in a weird way, there's a quality of this that is so aspirational and elegiac at the same time that in a weird, and I guess that's my white knuckle reference in my piece, but in a weird, weird way, because he's pulling the ripcord, he's doing it early. This is a very political move uh, to give the Biden White House an opportunity to fill this seat before any shenanigans, as you and uh, Senator Klobuchar talked about, could happen. The signaling almost feels like he's giving up on that aspiration that he has pushed in the face of relentless pressure. Just admit it, Justice Breyer, it's all just a game of politics. You're a football, step down. And he, the harder he was pushed on that, Rachel, the more he dug in. And so there's a part yeah. of me that feels as though the ideas he stood for, and Nina talked about this so eloquently, about bipartisanship, about cooperating, about not glomming onto the credit, letting someone else look good, getting results, these deep friendships he had with Justice Scalia, with Justice O'Connor, it feels like all that just detonated around him. And so he's standing there kind of with this womp womp, it's really not partisan, at the same time that he is making a really partisan retirement move. Those values that you just talked about, do you think that the justice in retiring in his meeting at the White House tomorrow with President Biden, that he'll try to shape the choice of his successor toward somebody with those same values? I don't think he would ever say anything of the sort, Rachel. I think he would think it's unseemly. And he often uh, would talk about you know, he doesn't have any opinions on judicial nominations. It, I think he would describe it as asking a chicken for its recipe for chicken a la king, which don't even, I don't know what it means. But I think he just didn't think it was appropriate to talk uh, deeply about those kinds of political things. But at the same time, I do think he really, really values the idea that the person who follows him will look at the court in this kind of mystical, oracular way, even if that's a disappearing value.